getting to the boat ramp on the weekend and I'm just here hoping to find the campsite that's not taken. This was one of my little escapes from uh, the realities of COVID last summer. And so why do I build boats? It's so I can do stuff like this. Yeah, there's drama, there's excitement at times if you want to pursue that. But more and more I find the value of just these really quiet little escapes at a good small boat in the kitchen. So, all right, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you, you probably are, or you wouldn't be watching, it might occur to you to ask, okay, well, why can't I just go out and buy one, right? I want a kayak, I can go out and buy a good kayak. Well, number one, no one really builds boats like this. Um, there's in, in the UK, in Britain, there's a pretty good market for these kind of small dinghy cruisers, they call them there, but there's not really a market for them in the US. So no one, no one builds them on a production level. If someone builds one as a one-off custom boat, well, you probably can't afford it. And I certainly can't. But more important, I think, and even better reason is building your own boat is just its own kind of magic. There's something special about it. And even now, four years after I launched my, my latest boat for the first time, just walking by it in the driveway, sitting on the trailer, I look at that and I see all the curves and I'm just like amazed that I built something like that. I started from, you know, a stack of wood and some plans. And now every time I go out in the water, that's something that I am invested in in a way that I wouldn't be if I just went out and bought it, which is good because I couldn't afford it anything. All right, so this, along with that video, this is why I build boats. I'm starting from the lower left-hand corner, simple little flat bottom plywood skiff. That's my brother there. He, he, he designed and built that, was his first um, sailboat built. Then a couple more views of my latest boat here up in the upper left in the center. And then over on the right, top right, you see a, another simple little boxy plywood boat. I built that at the same time as my brother's flat bottom skiff. And it was supposed to be a temporary boat that I would just build this to kind of get my feet wet and then I'd build a real boat. But it turned out to be so good that it took me on multi-week trips all over the Great Lakes and the Texas coast. So even a small, simple little boat can get you to so much adventure. And then the bottom right, that's a wonderful boat my brother built. Um, and you can see just all of these things, this, is why I build boats. I'm lazy enough if I could buy a boat like this, maybe I would if, if it were affordable. But you know, nobody's really building these kind of traditionally inspired boats and that's what makes it special. Okay, so let's talk about why wouldn't I go all the way back and do traditional boat building the way that it's been done for centuries, right? Real boat building. You know, there's even there's always a little bit of nagging guilt in my soul whenever I think about old traditional methods. And you can see here the cover of Wooden Boat magazine. Wooden Boat, if you don't know it, is kind of like the spiritual center of, of boat building in the U.S. and worldwide. Traditional builds, you see a couple of them there, big scale. This is what I used to think boat building was. You've got the huge timber keel and you've got the big frames and you're, you're trying to build this ship that'll you know, go out on the ocean, right? That kind of planking and building and construction takes high levels of skill. A lot of it involves hand tools. Um, and I have an asterisk marked on that saying, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I would love it to learn those skills. But number two, it also requires, you're using real wood, you're not using plywood, you're using timber, and you can't just go into a local store and buy that, right? It's a little harder to find woods that are suitable for traditional boat building. But really the, the deciding factor for anyone interested in this kind of a boating adventure is that traditionally built boats rely on the swelling of the wood planks. As they sit in the water, they soak up a little bit of water and they swell up. And the swelling actually locks the caulking in place and makes them watertight. So if you can keep your boat on the water year round, a traditionally boat, built boat makes sense. It'll swell up once 
and then it'll stop leaking and it'll be good as long as it stays wet. If you pull it out on a trailer every time you're done with a trip, uh, it's going to dry out and it'll leak all over again the next time you launch it. So if you're a trailer sailor, traditionally built boats really don't make much sense. Um, so modern construction uses different techniques to get around that and it uses typically plywood that doesn't rely on that swelling of the wood planks. So number three is the deal breaker for me. I have my boat, it lives on a trailer. I haul it all over the country to go sailing. I couldn't do that if it were a traditionally built boat. So what are the differences? What's modern boat building like? Well, here's a couple of pictures of my boat in progress. Um, that's my brother working there. Like I said, about a 50-50 deal. Well, first thing is it's much less intimidating. You're not making cuts as much as you are gluing things together, right? And these glues, modern epoxy glues and polyurethane glues are marvelous because they expand as they dry and they're stronger than the wood itself typically. So these, if you've got a gap, if your planks aren't perfectly planed together and there's a little gap there, that actually makes the joint stronger with modern glues because more glue gets in there and the glue is stronger than the wood. So it really kind of rewards lower skilled builders like me. Um, number two, plywood. I can walk down to the local big box store or the local lumber yard and get decent plywood. And if I want to use top grade marine plywood, I can order that, have it shipped to my door. So it's uh, a little bit easier to find materials to build your boats with when you're building with modern plywood. But again, the deal breaker, or in this case, the, the big benefit of modern techniques for me is that these boats don't soak up water and swell right? They're meant to keep water out. They've got glues, they've got fiberglass skins sometimes. And so you can pull your boat out on a trailer and leave it sit. It dries out. No big deal. You launch it again. It's not going to leak. So if you are looking for a trailer sailed boat, it makes all kinds of sense to use these modern techniques with waterproof glues and uh, plywood construction. So we're going to be looking at six basic, um, a very quick, like I say, a non-expert review. My perspective on this and the value I bring is, please believe me, if I can do these things, so can you. You know, it's a struggle for me to fix a leaky faucet, but I can build boats. So if you're at all interested, you can do it too. Um, we'll go, um, these are numbered in terms of complexity and uh, somewhat cost as well. So screw and glue, um, we'll talk about these in detail. Stitch and glue, strip built. This is what most people uh, maybe is their first introduction to modern boat construction. You see a strip built canoe and it's all varnished wood and it looks lovely and it's very lightweight. Um, strip planked. My boat is an example of strip plank and it's similar to strip built, but a little bit different. Glued lap strake, which is I think probably my favorite overall construction technique. And then uh, lap strake, by the way, is comes from, if you think of a Viking ship, how the planks are overlapping, that's what lap strake construction is. Whereas strip built and strip plank make a smooth skin, the glued lap strake makes kind of a step stairs um, thing with each plank overlapping the one below it. And then number six, I put an asterisk by because it's not quite, this, it's not quite wooden boat construction. It's basically building a wooden frame and putting a skin on it. Way back in uh, you know prehistory days, um, Inuit and Arctic cultures were building skin on frame boats. And these days you can do the same thing. So we'll do a very quick overview of each of these and then kind of a quick comparison at the end to maybe help you decide. If you wanna build a boat, how should you do it? Well, screw and glue. Here's a picture of the first boat that I, the first non-canoe boat that I had a hand in building. Um, this is kind of a, you can see it's basically a box that's pointy at one end. That's really what it is. It's very simple, cheap and fast. I think I built this boat with the help of my brother again in like three weekends, part-time weekend work. It didn't cost much. I actually tracked my costs and including the highly elegant plastic tarp sail you see there, um, which is stuck together with double-sided carpet tape. 
this whole book cost me 300 bucks. And uh, it was actually the subject of my first book because I enjoyed it so much. Um, simple, somewhat boxy. These things, when you look at them, they look like a boat, but you know, they're not quite the curvy beauty that you're gonna see in more traditional methods. Big advantage, number three, no building form. In traditional construction, you spend a lot of time setting up the framework and the, the form to bend wood over and make the right shape. In this, you just cut the pieces to the marked dimensions and uh, you, you put it together, basically. And because these boats are so simple, these are often kind of the gateway drug of boat building. Um, people build them and they feel kind of free to use cheaper materials. You can use um, cheaper glues. Sometimes people use a tight bond three, which is much cheaper than epoxy and much less toxic or uh, an expanding polyurethane glue. Um, again, they're all quite a bit cheaper than epoxy, not as strong, but when your boat costs 300 bucks and it lasts 10 years as it is, you really don't have to worry about using the best stuff, right? So that's, if you want cheap and fast to the water, screw and glue is hard to beat. It's, it's really makes a nice boat. And like I say, I've sailed that boat all over the Great Lakes and all over the Texas coast. And I'd still be sailing it today if I didn't have a better one. So how does it work? Well, you can see here, you, you basically, when you buy a set of boat plans, you get the dimensions for plywood panels. You draw them out on your plywood, you cut them out to the shape that the designer um, defined for you. And then you basically screw them and glue them together along this chine log, which is just this inner um, timber basically that gives you space to, to put screws into. So it's really simple construction. I think you could put a hull together for a boat like that um, in a weekend it really is that fast once you know what you're doing. So I think one of the big benefits of screw and glue construction is it's really easy to understand. You look at this and you think, well, yeah, it's not much different from building a piece of furniture or building a table or building a bench, right? It's just a couple of sheets of plywood screwed together with a chine log. And if you haven't caught on, this is going to be a fast and, and very oversimplified presentation. But if you want a cheap boat um, and you want it on the water quickly, screw and glue designs have a lot going for them. So let's look at the next step up in complexity, stitch and glue. Um, so you can see this boat here has got a little more shape to it, right? It's a little rounder. It's a little, it's got kind of two panels to each side, a top panel and then a bottom panel, and they come together at an angle, kind of like a V. So a V bottom instead of a flat bottom. So it's, it's gonna cut through the water a little more cleanly, slice through waves, whereas a flat bottom boat will pound a little bit when it gets wavy. So overall, these kind of boats, because their shape is more complex, they're gonna perform a little better still very easy to build. You can see up here in number one, um, they use a lot of epoxy. And uh, that's why a lot of people will call this stitch and goo. It can be a messy process. The epoxy isn't the cheapest thing in the world. Um, so I think that's probably a fair label actually. Um, I watched my brother build a stitch and glue. I've never actually built one myself. And I, um, but you can see it's a boat. It's a beautiful boat. It's got curves to it. Again, the advantage of this is you don't need to set up a complicated building form very quickly. And the number four, this can be really important if it's your first project. Almost as soon as you start this thing, it's going to go 3D. In other words, it's going to be in the shape of a boat and it's going to look like a boat. And that's a really good motivation. So how does this work? Well, again, you get the dimensions for your plywood hull panels. And you can see here, there's two hull panels. Whoops, let me jump back. There's two hull panels and you drill holes along the edge of each panel and you stick wires through and you just wire them together temporarily and it holds the shape of a boat. And like I say, that could be coming together in the first few days once you've got your plywood panels cut out a day or two later, bam, you're looking at something that looks like a boat. So now it's held in place by these wires and you 
basically fill the seams with a whole bunch of thickened epoxy glue. And then you put fiberglass tape, um, which is like a cloth that becomes very hard when it gets filled with epoxy. Put fiberglass tapes on the inside and outside of each seam. And then you cut the wires off or sometimes people use plastic zip ties. So they just cut them off and they can sand them down. Um, when the glue's dry, pull the wires or the zip ties and then you've got a boat. And typically the entire hull is also covered with fiberglass and epoxy. So a step up in complexity, probably a step up in, you know, kind of satisfying. It's, it's gonna look more like a boat and less like a box. Next up, uh, this was my first, in not, not my particular canoe, but strip built construction was my introduction to wooden boat building. I built a couple of um, strip built canoes. They are lightweight and very strong. Um, so the idea of when you glue all these strips together, it becomes essentially one single piece and the skin itself carries a lot of the, carries almost all of the structural strength of this boat. So if you look inside this canoe, you've got two benches and then two little decks at each end. And that's all the structure there is that's holding this together because the skin itself, that wooden skin is so strong, it doesn't need much interior framing. Um, beautiful, you can make any shape basically with this technique. Sailboats, canoes, kayaks, um, is very beginner friendly. You're working with small pieces of wood that bend easily. And if you break one, it's not gonna break the bank. Um, it's a little bit tedious. Um, when I built my sailboat, I had to put in 66 strips. They're, these are 20 foot long strips, so they're long and floppy. Um, but again, I built it, basically did most of that planking all by myself. Tedious, but easy, and it just wasn't very intimidating. The drawback maybe, if there is one, <laughs> when you get the hull all glued together, unless you're a much better workman than I am, there's gonna be a lot of glue drips and bumps and everything, and you're gonna do a lot of sanding time. But the result is worth it, as you can see here. Uh, similar to, oh, so let's look at one in progress. So typically, you're looking at strips of wood that are a quarter inch thick. So they bend really easily. But this is the first technique where you have to do some prep work beforehand. So you can see here these temporary molds. If you can imagine a canoe that someone slices up like a loaf of bread, and typically every two feet, you're gonna set up one of these slices and you have to build this on a very sturdy a bench or table called a strong back. It's gotta be perfectly level and lined up because otherwise you're gonna build a, a curved banana boat. And you set up all your molds. So you're gonna invest a lot of time before you even touch the first piece of anything that's gonna be part of your boat. You're gonna be building the frame, the strong back, the molds and all of that stuff. So it takes more prep work than the stitch and glue or the screw and glue technique. Um, so that's one thing. And typically these strips are often done with just white glue, like a, a Titemon 3 kind of wood glue. It's not toxic at all, water cleanup. So it's messy, but it's not toxic. It's, it's much nicer to work with. And the reason you can do that is the glue doesn't have to be super strong because this, these wood strips are just a filler. They're essentially just a core material that does nothing structural. And when you put fiberglass cloth over the outside and inside, that's the magic. The two layers are essential because all of the strength of strip built boats comes from the fiberglass skin and not from the wood itself. So you're gonna be doing a lot of work with fiberglassing if you do this technique of strip built boats. <clears throat> but beautiful, curvy, complex shapes. Strip planking, and I use these terms, I think it's becoming more and more common, is very similar, but this technique actually goes back well before modern glues. If you go back, uh, oh, 150 years, people were already building strip plank. This is my latest boat here. And I like this view of it because it shows off that lovely wine glass transom at the back end. And it shows a lot of the curves. And man, every time I look at that, even now, 
I can't help but like being a little bit surprised, but also really happy that I built something like that, right? It's, it's really cool. So beautiful round hull shapes. You can see at the back end, a reverse curve. So even that wine glass shape was not hard to build at all because the strips are thin. And again, like strip built boats, beginner friendly, not very intimidating, somewhat tedious. Um, and again, lots of fairing and sanding are gonna be required at the end. So how does this work? How's it different? <coughs> The difference is, well, you've got the same kind of setup with the temporary molds if you're slicing your boat up like a loaf of bread. So every two feet or one feet maybe at the, the ends, you're gonna put up one of these temporary things. So again, you're gonna invest a lot of time drawing out, plotting out these curves of the boat from the plans that are never gonna be a piece of your boat. They're just a form to build the boat over. But in addition, strip planked boats use heavier wood strips and they include a permanent backbone. Um, that's The backbone is kind of the collective name for the keel, which is what that top yellow arrow is pointing at. And then the curved piece at the, the front end, the stem, right? So the stem and the keel, those are structural timbers. They are the first pieces of the boat and they will stay in the boat. The temporary molds are just there to make the shape when you're done, you pull those out. So you don't need, so these strips are thick enough that you often nail them together. So my, my boat used glue and nails. It's much stronger than a strip built and you don't need fiberglass. So I did put fiberglass on the outside, figuring that can't hurt. It's gonna give a little abrasion resistance to the wood planking but it's doing nothing structural at all. The wood is strong enough to do all the structural work. So <clears throat> that's strip planked boats and they tend to make heavier boats, much heavier, stronger. But it's basically just kind of like a strip built boat on steroids. And then maybe the most elegant in a lot of people's eyes is lap straight construction. So there's traditional lap straight, which typically uses copper rivets to hold planks together. But the modern style uses modern epoxy glues to glue the planks together. This is my brother in the latest boat he built, um, or might not be the latest, he's built a few more since then. <clears throat> and you can see that like a Viking ship, right? It's got each plank in the hull overlaps the one above it. And you get those lines really kind of draw the viewer's attention to the shape of the boat. And it really, really looks nice. And one of the interesting things is as you're moving through the water in a lap straight boat, those little overlaps catch the water. And there's this very distinctive chuckling sound of water pouring over those overlaps that you don't get in any other kind of boat. So it's pretty cool. Just like, um, with the strip plank boats, you've got that permanent backbone, some temporary molds, and you can build any shape with a glued lap straight, right? So just like a strip built and a strip plank boat, you can build complex round shapes. The thing that sets this apart is when I built my boat, I didn't shape my strips at all. I put them all together on the boat, glued them, nailed them together, and they were square. They were all the same shape. In a lap straight boat, you've got many fewer planks. I believe this has five planks on a side. My boat, strip planked, had 33 planks on a side. So would seem to give this method an advantage, except that you have to do a lot of individual shaping for each plank. The payoff really comes at the end when, because your planks are plywood, when you're done gluing and screwing them together, there's really not much sanding to be done. The plywood's already smooth, right? If you've chosen quality plywood. So I think if I were to build another boat, I would be going for glued lap straight construction. Now I, <clears throat> I feel ready to take that on. And I think the advantage of less sanding is pretty attractive for me. Um, so how does this work exactly? You can see kind of a contrast here. Carvel built is uh, the name for the old traditional style where you'd put cotton in between 
each plank and it, they'd swell up with water and become watertight. On the left, that's the Viking ship style where the planks overlap. And you can see after like cut a little angle on the edge of each plank, a bevel that's called, so that the next plank will fit. But because every time you've got a plank on plank, you're basically doubling the hull stiffness. It's like making a whole bunch of structural timbers as you plank the hull. Um, and then the fussy fitting bits at the front, you have to cut in a little ramp in each plank so that the overlap disappears. We'll take a look at what that looks like. So here's a plywood plank for a glued lap straight boat on a workbench. And you can see where the yellow arrow is pointing. This is the start of where this little ramp fits. So you take a, a plane, usually done with a hand plane, and you plane a long slope to the edge of the plywood. And then the next plank to overlap this one fits onto that ramp. And because it sinks deeper as the ramp progresses, you end up at the front of the boat that overlap just kind of disappears very gracefully into the, the bow of the boat. So when you're making a boat like my brother's lap straight one, you've only got 10 planks, but every plank that you make has to be hand shaped because they're all different shapes. And then every one of them needs one of these gains put in. And like I said, the payoff is you don't really have near the amount of sanding and fairing when you're all done. <clears throat> And the last method, not entirely, I guess, fair to call this a wooden boat method, but skin on frame. And here's my brother again. Um, he's built a couple of these. I built, I have a skin on frame kayak in progress. And you can see that there's a skin kind of half see-through here. And you can start to see some of the wooden frame underneath it. So this is by far the cheapest, fastest, least intimidating method that I've used to build a boat. It, it's really quite shocking how easily one of these boats goes together. They end up with a very ultra light weight. Um, obviously there's not much wood in it. It's mostly a polyester or nylon fabric. So that boat there, um, 15 foot kayak, probably weighs less than 30 pounds. It's easy for one person to pick it up and put it on top of a car without any help whatsoever. The cool thing about these boats is a lot of these designs like this one, there's no glue, no screws, no nails, no nothing except for lashing. So there again, it's like the, the kayaks or the canoes we looked at slice this boat like a loaf of bread. There are frames in there and they're notched to fit wooden beams into, but it's all lashed together with artificial sinew. There's no fasteners and no glue whatsoever. That's just really cool. If you're gonna build a skin on frame boat with a sailing rig, well, the sail puts a lot more stress on the hull. They end up kind of needing a lot more wood in the framework. So you're not gonna build a sailboat probably that you can pick up and put on top of a car by yourself. But with two people, you probably can. So. Skin on frame, how does it work? Um, here you can see, this is what it looks like before the skin puts on. Those curvy things sticking out like ears, those are outriggers for oars. So this is not a paddling boat, this is gonna be a rowboat. Um, but you can see that there's some long pieces of wood, but they're very small, right? They're very easy to bend into shape. And they're all lashed in place. You can see the dark colored lashings. So they're just tied in place on these frames. And of course the frames are hollow in the middle so that you can stick your feet in and to save weight. Um, so you get done with that frame, that can come together in just a few days, really. Um, when I built my skin on frame kayak, probably less than a week before it was all put together like that. And again, you don't have a building frame. You start immediately, the first things you're working on are going to be pieces of the boat. And then when you're done, here's another look, there's a frame. And then when you're done, you take a, a cloth skin. The, the two major choices I've seen people use are polyester or nylon. And you stretch that cloth skin over and with kayaks, you end up so that you've got a seam on the top of your boat. So. The cloth wraps all the way around the bottom and meets at, at the top. 
and you hand sew that skin one long seam along the top of your boat. And there's kind of tricks to building those round cockpit um, combings and stuff as well. Um, but a lot of fun and really pretty easy to do and fast. If you're building a, a sailing boat or a boat without decks, oftentimes that skin is just going to get stapled um, along the top of the boat. So you don't really have the hand sewing you do with a boat that's got decks. <clears throat> And then the cloth by itself is not watertight, so you varnish it, you paint it, you do something. Um, oftentimes you heat shrink it with a hairdryer or a heat gun, and it becomes much tighter, and then you paint it or varnish it. So that's skin on frame. So here we've got a chart that I tried to kind of put it all together in my head. And again, I know it's if you don't want to be, if, if you don't have time to read everything here on the chart, put a link here in the upper right on the website, I've got this chart available for download. This is one person's opinion, right? So you get different opinions from other people, but here's what I see. Screw and glue, minimal skill. Stitch and glue, minimal-ish. Um, I, I say that it probably seems a little more difficult to most people. Strip build, boy, I just think that's simple. Anyone can understand all oh, these little bendy strips of wood. Strip planked, not much different, but because you've got the permanent backbone to build, you need a little more prep work and probably a little more skill might seem a little more intimidating to people. Blue lap strake, I think people find a little bit intimidating because they know they have to get the planks shaped right and every plank is a different shape and they're not usually, they're often not pre-plotted. So you have to measure and figure out the plank shapes yourself. It's really not very difficult, but it seems intimidating when people are first thinking about it. They're like, oh, I, I don't think I could cut out the planks accurately. You can also get kits where the planks are cut out with a CNC machine and they're perfectly accurate and you just put them together. But if you're building from plans, I think more people are more scared of glued lap streak than they need to be. Having watched my brother um, build his boat, it's really not as intimidating as you might think. And then a the skin on frame, boy, if you're just wanting to try something and you're really not sure, I would say very minimal. This is the most forgiving, the most, the least stressful method is very cheap and very fast. So that can be a good introduction to a lot of people, to boat building for a lot of people. Um, the hull shape, that's another one to think about. Screw and glue, man, I love my little screw and glue boat. When I look at it now though, it seems a little bit crude. I think it's a pretty typical progression that people start that way because it seems simple and they know they can build it. And then the more involved they get in with using boats, the less satisfied they tend to be with that kind of a construction. And then moving to the right across the chart, <clears throat> you get um, more and more complex and beautiful shapes. So if the beauty matters and face it, it probably does, that's wooden boats are beautiful things then there's a lot of rewards to be found in those other techniques where you can build a true round bottom hull. <clears throat> um, the gluing, eh, that's an issue for some people. Um, you're you're going to make messes. You're going to have a lot of glue in almost all of these techniques, except for skin on frame, which really doesn't use any glue. Probably the worst one as far as using amounts of glue and amounts of time working with messy glue is the stitch and glue, right? So if that matters to you, if you're a kind of person who makes a mess anytime you open a glue bottle, that might be something to think about. The big advantage of strip built boats, you don't need that toxic glue. The wood is just a white tight bound glue or something is all you need. Fiberglass cloth, uh, this is not such a big deal. Um, Typically, how you do fiberglassing is you put a big cloth of fiberglass over the top of your boat, and then you brush on some epoxy glue to fill up the cloth and harden it. But um, stitching glue, you definitely use a lot of fiberglass cloth. 
strip built, you're going to be fiberglassing inside and out. None of the others really require fiberglass cloth. So that's something to consider. <clears throat> Another element of the complexity is that do you need to build that elaborate building frame? The strong back, the temporary molds, maybe the permanent backbone. Well, screw and glue and stitch and glue? No, you don't. That's one of the things that makes these boats go together so quickly. And again, skin on frame, no building form. You, you just build the boat as it is. And the other ones, yeah, it's a little more involved because you've got all that preparation to set up your building frame and strong back. But again, anyone that can put screws into wood can learn to build a strong back. Same thing in finishing. Um, minimal for the boats that use plywood flat shapes, right? So you put your plywood together, maybe you've got to touch up the seams, but the plywood itself was already smooth. Stitch and glue, you're gonna have lots of sanding and fairing. Strip build, lots and lots. Strip plank, lots and lots. Because every plank, there's gonna be little places where it overlaps or underlaps and they're not even. Um, <clears throat> So deal with it, it's reality. Glued lap strake, <clears throat> that's one of the things that really I find attractive about it is the minimalish sanding and skin on frame. Yeah, you might have to round the edges of a few of your frame pieces or something, but really there's almost no sanding involved. There's not much wood involved. Okay, so each method, it's not like one is bad, one is good. They all have advantages, screw and glue. You can't beat this for fast, cheap, simple, low skill requirement. Again, it's just a box that's pointy at one end. And most people feel pretty confident they can jump in and build a box. Stitch and glue, um, you can start to make some decently complex shapes. Depending how many hull panels you want, a stitch and glue boat can start to look very round like a lap straight boat. Um, you don't need the building form. Typically your planks, you get the shapes and the plans and you cut them out to the shape and you just stitch it together. Strip built, they're beautiful, round, complex shapes. It's easy to understand. You can look at this and understand how to put it together. Same thing with strip planking. Again, this seems fairly forgiving to me. I, I jumped into building my boat and I wasn't intimidated because I could understand putting one strip on top of another and nailing it together with some glue in between. Glued lap straight, um, beautiful round shapes. And some people really like the appeal of those lap straight overlapping lines like the Viking ship look to it. Um, I think that's great myself. And you have probably the least amount of fairing and sanding with any boats. And skin on frame again, cheap, simple, super lightweight no exposure to toxic glues or messes. It's, there's really almost no drawbacks to skin and frame. Main disadvantages, if I'm thinking about this, the reality is no matter what method you choose to build a boat, there's gonna be times during your build when you're kicking yourself and thinking, I should have chosen a different method. When you're building a strip plank or a strip build boat, it's going great. And then you get to all the sanding and you're like, God, I should have built glued lap straight. When you're building a glued lap straight boat, you're like, oh man, it's so hard to shape these planks and it takes so much care to do each individual plank. I should have built a strip plank boat. So resign yourself to that reality. No matter what method you choose, you will be wishing you had chosen the different method at some point. There's no way around it. All of these methods have their own things you won't like about them. Main disadvantage of the screw and glue like I say, the more I've been around boats and using boats, I'm just not satisfied with the simple boxy shapes anymore. That said, again, I put hundreds and hundreds of miles sailing and cruising my boat in the wilderness. It was simple boxy and really crudely built. And it didn't bother me until I had been doing it long enough and I wanted something more beautiful. Um, stitch and glue. Gluing, fairing, sanding, and fiberglass work, probably more than with almost any other method. So it's tedious. Every hull seam has to be glassed, glued, and then the whole hull glassed. So that's a lot going on. Strip built, gluing, fairing, sanding, and glassing. Yes, um, some of that's eased by the fact that you can use 
tight bond three for the strips. Um, strip plank, very similar, lots of fairing and sanding. And these are not very lightweight boat. My, my boat, 18 feet long, is heavy enough that my wife and I can just barely lift it up and lift it off the trailer if we need to. So that's, that's a pretty heavy boat. <clears throat> um, when I think about my boat, I think I've figured out 66 strips on the hull and each strip maybe 15 feet long. So you can see you're spreading a lot of glue when you're building with strip built or strip length boats. Blue lap strake, I think really the main disadvantage is that it takes a little more care and foresight and, and time to develop the skills needed to shape those planks just right and get them individually shaped. Now, I mentioned kits before. If you buy a kit where the planks are already cut out for you, that advantage or that disadvantage just disappears entirely. And then it's more, um, you know, you've still got your strong back and your building frame and your temporary molds that you have to build, but you're not have, having to worry about the the individual shaping of planks. Skin on frame. So if there's a disadvantage of this, um, it's a lot of handwork. If you're building a kayak or a deck boat where you've got a seam to sew, you may be sewing 20 feet by hand, right? Um, and if you're building a sailing boat out of skin on frame, well, to resist the stresses of the mast and the sail, you're gonna need to do more wooden framing. And so, you're probably going to end up with a heavier boat than the typical um, typical skin on frame. So they're all great. Every one of these can make a great boat. And like I say, at some point, whatever method you choose, you'll be thinking that you probably should have chosen a different method, but it wouldn't have been any different. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just reality. At least for me, it is. So let's take a look at how little kind of a semi time lapse here. So this is, you really have two options when you're boat building. I think the more common and the cheaper option is to build from a set of plans. So this is a set of plans and hard to tell on the screen how big they are. I'm not sure if my thumbnail video is showing, but this is a typical size for a set of boat plans. And you might get 10, 15, 20 sheets that give you the shape and dimensions of each piece. Um, this set of boat plans lists 103 separate wooden pieces to put the boat together. And I left a few out, but uh, it still floats. Um, so that's a set of plans. The other alternative is more and more so popular boat designs for backyard builders are finding people to market them as kits. So they'll take a, a CNC um, cutter and they'll cut out all of the wood. So if you buy a kit, you're gonna pay a lot of money up front, but then you've got all of the pieces there and it really speeds up construction and, and it can ease some anxieties about, do I really have the skill to shape these things? Um, I've never built with a kit, but the people I've talked to that have, have created beautiful boats and they, I haven't heard anyone say they wish they hadn't have gotten a kit. The difference is the upfront cash cost is significantly higher. So this boat we're looking at now in the plans, it took me between grad school and living overseas for a while. It took me seven years spread, you know, probably about two months a year on average, but a course of seven years to start and finish this boat. And I probably spent, oh, I think maybe less than $2,500 on, on the whole thing, not including the sales. I think if a kit for this similar boat might run you somewhere between seven to $10,000. The difference is the kits are gonna be the highest quality materials. I'm building a boat for myself. I did a little compromising. I used, um, you know, cheaper materials that I, in my judgment, were still adequate. And my boat's still afloat after four years, so I haven't been proven wrong yet. 
Um, so kit or plans, if you're gonna do a plan build, a little bit of a kind of a quick overview of what my build was like. Starting again in the, the bottom left-hand corner, you've got your temporary molds and backbone, then called your strong back here and you putting planks around it. Um, upper left corner, that's what the hull looks like when it's done, but before it's fared. And then the next picture, top, center, you can see the boat is strapped together because it doesn't have the framing to hold its shape once you take it off the mold. So we measured how wide it's supposed to be and we put straps to hold it in that shape. You can also see the darker colored wood that's dug fir. That's the structural backbone. That was the very first piece of the boat to get put on the building frame. And it's this the backbone. And you can see the slot in the center. That's for a pivoting center board because it's a sailboat. And you can also see up in the front of the boat, there's a little kind of a darker yellow patch in the wood. Right up until there, I've already sanded the hull. And then it's much rougher and unfinished because I haven't finished the sanding there. Um, and then bottom right, you know, you keep building stuff. So that, that top center photo with the boat, with the straps holding its shape, you get to thinking, wow, the hull is planked. I'm almost done, right? Or I'm at least halfway done. <clears throat> no. Um, at that point, if you're building a boat like this, fairly complex, a lot of interior furniture and benches and a centerboard, I would say at that stage where the hull is empty but strapped together, might be 30% of the work. So you're not even halfway there when you get the hull done. You can see each of these plywood uh, bench supports and thwarts have to be put in, they have to be shaped. Um, and that all takes time. And but it's, it's, it's quite fun. And then the finished product here, the first big trip I took in this boat was to the Canadian side of Lake Huron. And you can see, you've got a little cargo storage with a couple of big dry bags. And I believe the longest trip I've taken like this on Lake Huron, I was aboard uh, 38 days one summer and just, you know, made all of the work worth it. So construction, and then of course, here's where we all want to end up the adventure, right? So to bring it back, why I build boats is that notion of the sail and oar boat. It's a mode of wilderness travel that it's like kayaking and pretty much anywhere a kayak can go, this boat can go. Um, but I can move around, I can stand up, I've got a little more comfort. And this boat is actually set up, so I, it's got a platform I can set up and sleep aboard under a tent at anchor. So it's very versatile, cheap. Once I get to the launching point, I'm not spending any more money. The wind is free, rowing is free, and it's quiet. So I run across minks and beavers and all kinds of animals close up. Um, so that's why I like to do it. I get out in the wilderness and I can travel around and I'm getting old and geezerly enough that I really appreciate not having to carry anything. <laughs> and I've even become decrepit enough so that I've taken to throwing in a folding camp chair in my boat when I go sailing, which is just an unheard of concession for me. I never would carry one around backpacking. Um, so that's boats. If, if you were interested in this, is just really the briefest overview it, again, if you go to my website, you can see tompamperin.com at the bottom. I have uh, a couple of PDFs up there where you can, to jump back, you can get um, this PowerPoint. If you want to look at the slides a little more slowly at your own speed, you can get that. You can also get a document I set up that's got sources for boat plans and kits. You really think, wow, I, I really do want to learn more about this. Um, I've really given you some, some of the most valuable links to places where you can find out boat plan and find out how to build. And then you can see that I've got a couple other presentations coming up at the Expo. 30,000 Islands, One Small Boat, that takes me on a multi-week cruising trip in this boat on, on Lake Huron's Georgian Bay. And then around the Alno, um, that's Lake of the Woods in Ontario, Minnesota as well. Um, spent a week on a cruising trip around there. So I invite you to join me on any of those. 
And uh, Adana, I guess I'll ask right now if there's any questions in the chat or anybody. Uh, not that I see. Um, I just want to say that uh, this really helped uh, <laughs> explain a lot. Uh, I would say that from my personal experience, um, I've never tried to make a vote by any means, but the one that I think uh, that stands out to me that I've seen maybe most people make is probably that um, the strip built. I'm not sure if I'm using the right term. And, yeah. you know, that's that's just got a, it's got a classic look. It's, uh, you know, looks very kind of homemade. It's got a very nice aesthetic to it. Um, I think if I were to build one and I'd have to d dig a bit deeper into the, the each of the vigil bills. But I think I, the one that interests me most probably is the lap shake. Oh. Yeah. And, and not because of the sanding. I, I actually don't mind sanding or, or sanding, <laughs> but I think uh, I, I when you mentioned the uh, that chuckle of the water, that to me just really stood out. And that to me is, I think, something that would really, um, uh, I, make, uh, yeah, really kind of accentuate our adventures. So <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's a, you know, if you've never been aboard a lap street boat, you, you wouldn't know that. But everyone that's been aboard it, it's one of the things they really love about it. It's, yeah. It doesn't happen with the boat we're looking at on this screen, but you get my brother's lap streak and it's got that different little trickling sound that's mm -hmm. just, yeah. Yeah, um, pretty cool. Yeah, we, we don't, um you know, we're not a sailing shop by any means, but we are definitely a boating shop and, uh, you know, having, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our customers and, and adventurers that come in here have, Many disciplines. Oftentimes, it's what you know. You ask someone here at the shop, "What do you like doing the best?" And then sometimes the answer is like, "Whatever it is I'm doing at the moment." Because <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I really appreciate your your time and your presentation. Uh, this has definitely given me um, a bit more of a better understanding of the different styles and possibly the the work that's involved. <laughs> um, and I love seeing the the process. So thank you for sharing this. Yeah. Well, thanks. And I'll just end, I guess, by. By saying, I know I mentioned it took me seven years to build this boat, but when you think about the time I actually spent building, most of that was while I was living in other places. But then I also, I still had my boxy screw and glue boat that mm -hmm. was already finished. So when summer nice weather came along, instead of working on my new boat, I was out sailing the cheap one um, there you go. for years. <laughs> and nice. uh, if you broke it down, I probably, 14 months, I think would be a good guess that how long it would have taken had I done it all without any interruptions. Yeah. Do you find that, or did you find that you had a lot of the tools necessary or in the beginning where you're like, uh, well, I need to buy definitely maybe a bunch more clamps or this or that. Some... Ah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, traditional boat building, there's a lot of specialized tools that go along with it. None of these methods here really need anything too far out of a basic woodworking set. Nice. Um, the one couple of things, a table saw, especially if you're ripping your own strips, table saw is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And uh, I, an electric planer. I splurged oh, nice. for a really good high-end electric planer and I use it all the time. It's my favorite tool. Nice. Um, and then some hand planes and more clamps than you could possibly buy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure all different sizes. <laughs> yeah. That makes, do you have a preference on either like hand clamps or sort of those, uh, the trigger style, the sliders? I, so the ones that I rely on the most are, are C clamps just mm -hmm. because they're stronger. But the thing about epoxy, you don't really need much clamping pressure. Yeah. So I, the spring clamps, if they're big enough to fit around what you're gluing together, those are the handiest. And then bar clamps yeah. where they're a quick slide. Those yes. can be plenty good too. Oh, nice. Cool. And they have a, a much wider reach, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some downstairs in our shop that are probably over four feet long. They're massive. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, big ones. Great. Um, well, great. I appreciate you also mentioning your other presentations. Uh, the 30,000 Islands One Small Boat is on Thursday, April 29th from 12 to 1. And then around the all new. Small Boat Journey on Lake of the Woods. That's on Sunday, May 2nd. That'll be the last day of the expo. Uh, for those of you that are watching, um, we are archiving all of these presentations. They'll be on our YouTube page, probably hopefully within about 72 hours or so. Um, we have lots more presentations coming up today. Um, um, we have a kayak fishing and a stand-up stand -up paddleboard presentation, I think, across Lake Superior. So those should be pretty exciting as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I, I have to catch that one for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, if you miss it, we, like I said, it'll be recorded. So uh, you can watch it at, you know, anytime you want in your pajamas or whatever, whatever you'd like. Tom, thanks again. Um, I'll go ahead and say goodbye and I look forward to your other presentations. Um, All right. Um, have a wonderful day and thank you so much. Thanks for your help and you too. Bye now. All right.